it. So I'm um, doing this on behalf of the on uh, behalf of California Nevada Philippine Solidarity Task Force, of which I've recently become co-chair, and I'm still trying to remember. Co-chair! Yeah. All right. So, um, so I'm going to start off with Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought him to all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they answered to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring town, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. So, I know that for many of us, we've been here for a series of days, and um, there's a lot... Um, to absorb in our gatherings here together. And it may be for some of us a little bit, um, it's exciting, but at the same time, it might be, you know, draining some of our energy. So to wake us up a little bit, I was wondering if we could um, come together in a chant. So for those of you who know it, it goes, rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up, my people, rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up, my people, rise up. So we find Simon's mother-in-law in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. There are times when my feminist or womanist lenses cause me to react to texts like this in the Bible in such a way that I get triggered and shut off from being able to see the rest of the story. You know, like what comes to mind, how patriarchal. As soon as this sick woman is healed, she gets up and starts serving the men. <laughs> Those of you like me who are holding that lens, let's take a look at the text from a different angle. I'm not asking you to put away that lens, but, you know, let's try to unpack this story a little bit. Jesus takes this woman by the hand, a person with an illness who would be considered unclean by the standards of ancient Hebrew socio-religious law. Scholar Chris Haslam writes of Jesus taking Simon Peter's mother-in-law by the hand that no respected religious leader would do so, especially not on the Sabbath. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. This woman was healed instantly to the extent that she didn't need time to recover. It wasn't that right after she was healed, she was forced into servitude. After all, she had been lying in bed already for however long. I'm sure her family would have probably encouraged her that she lie down a bit or else she may relapse. But instead, this woman, having been lifted up by Jesus, the teacher, the healer, gets up to serve, gets up to resume her role in that household, in that community. Ideally, it may have been nicer if Jesus had given her a different role in the community, but maybe he does by being the first person he heals in the privacy of the home of a disciple, by giving her the role of someone who could bear witness to who Jesus was through personal and lived experience. Simon Peter's mother-in-law serves. In the Greek, the word jakoneo, uh, yeah, jakoneo, means to serve. It's where we get our word deaconess or deacon. So Simon Peter's mother-in-law doesn't enter the story to be another unliberated woman waiting for a man to rescue her so that she can get up again to serve men her entire life. Instead, Simon Peter's mother-in-law is the first person in the Gospel of Mark who lives out true discipleship. Scholar Sarah Heinrich reminds us that throughout the text, it is women who are described as serving Jesus, whereas this verb, serving or to serve, is not used of Jesus' male disciples. We all remember, don't really get it, in the story of the gospel itself. The words, he lifted 
her up could be translated in the Greek as he raised her, which in this gospel references the resurrection that is to come at the end of the gospel. The text uses the Greek word igero, which is a word that suggests empowerment, that new strength is given to those brought low, brought low by illness, unclean spirits, even death, so that they can rise up and take their places in the world again. Also remember that back in the day, back in those days, when a fever, um, a fever often led to death, and we aren't told very much about that fever or the conditions of her illness, but we do know that whatever she had, she needed to be lifted up out of, and she couldn't do whatever work she was called to do. She wasn't able to live out her calling. She was unable to serve because of that illness. And according to Heinrich, illness bore a very social cost. Not only would a person be unable to earn a living or contribute to the well-being of a community or a household, but their proper role in that community to be honored as a valuable member of that village or town would be taken from them too. It was her calling and her honor to show hospitality to guests in her home. Being cut off from that role by an illness, cut off from doing what you know, she was integrated into her world, um, kind of took away her purpose. Who was she when she was no longer able to engage in her calling? In mainstream US society, we're often valued as products and as consumers. Our education is production-based, even more so than before, where standardized tests become valued more than the ability to think critically, where the things that produce culture, arts, crafts, music, etc are the first things to get cut from a budget, which ironically are the first things we look for archaeologically when we look for a civilized community. We keep lowering the budget for our public schools and then hike up tuition costs for higher education. The privilege of being seen as a valuable, productive individual in society is based more and more on if you come from a family already deemed valuable by how much they can produce how much they're getting paid, actually, how much buying power they have. In our society, we have made money synonymous with value and quality, which may be true with some products, but we apply this to people as well. Then there are other illnesses.